So the first panel for today um, is on, in fact, leadership, which Julia has just set us up perfectly to discuss. Um, and I have three wonderful panellists. Um, Janelle Weissman, who for 25 years has been working in the social justice area in organisations both here uh, in the US and, and elsewhere in the world. She's the executive director of UN Women Australia, and I've had the delight of working with her on a number of occasions. Um, and she is in charge with her team of implementing uh, UN Women's global agenda uh, through fundraising and advocacy uh, in this country and in the region. So it's great to have her along. Um, um, also today we have Yemi Penn. Uh, Yemi is an engineer by profession. Um, she's a tireless advocate uh, for equality and equity in the STEM area. She's also an entrepreneur um, and the work that she's done in that space has been written up in publications around the world. And she also not long ago did her first TEDx talk. So it's a great delight to have um, Yemi along with us. Um, last, by no means least, uh, Tanya Plibersek is also joining us. She's, of course, the Shadow Minister for Education and for Women and the Federal Member for Sydney. Um, and she's held that seat. Uh, she entered federal parliament in 1998. Um, Tanya, of course, was uh um, a, a minister in the, in the Gillard and Rudd governments, including a minister for health, minister for medical research and for housing, um, and of course, minister for the status of women. So it is wonderful as well to have uh, Tanya along with us. So um, we have these, uh, we have about 30 minutes to have a discussion here around leadership. So I thought it would be, oh, now I can see you all. <laughs> Welcome and thank you so much for joining us on this important discussion. Um, Yemi, can I start with you? I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, particularly from your engineering and STEM background, on the kinds of leadership that you've observed over the years, um, the, the good and, and the not so good, um, around creating an inclusive and fair workplace. Thank you, thank you so much. And an absolute honor to be here. Um, look, without putting any ages or numbers on my age, over probably the past 20 years in which I've been in the engineering industry, you can see a real change in the number of women that have gone into the field. And one thing that has been consistent, and a lot of my experience has been within the UK and then in Australia in the past seven and a half years, is that we've actually had more men speak up. And I, and I have to say that within Australia in particular, you've actually got more men who are advocates for changes and dedicated towards getting equality, especially within the STEM fields. However, it's, it's still got a way to go because they are a few who eventually get tired and fatigued of being the only voice to talk about change. So from a leadership perspective, that's probably been the biggest change that I've seen. And which is why, you know, completely agree with everything Julia said of, we actually need to get more people. We can't just expect women, especially in the STEM space in this instance, to constantly talk for why we need equality, why we need to, you know, get the balance more equal. And that's probably been the biggest shift that I've seen which is, is fantastic to hear. Um, Tanya, can I ask you, um, having been uh, in federal parliament for, for many years, um, what's changed and what hasn't changed, I suppose, importantly, um, for women in that workplace? Because of, of course, the revelations from this year have, have shown us a very ugly picture, but what, has anything shifted since that, that period that you've been there? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, this year uh, with the um, the coming forward of Brittany Higgins talking about her own experiences in the building and then the outpouring of other people coming forward, uh, I think was a real reminder that we've still got a long way to go in Parliament House as a workplace and that many Australian workplaces need very substantial reform when it comes to sexual harassment uh, and, uh, and safety of... Um, of workplaces. I guess the biggest difference in the time that I've been here is the, the change in critical mass in the Labor Party. When I started, we were about a quarter uh, female um, senators and members of the House of Representatives, and now we're close to half. And, and critical mass does make a difference. Uh, it's, mm. as Julia was saying, uh, as Yemi just said, it is exhausting when you're one of a minority constantly having to police the behaviour of the majority or feeling as though you ought to be. Um, there's just, it's just a, it's a 
better, more welcoming organisation now. It feels safer. Uh, it doesn't mean that we haven't still got work to do, but it's a very different feeling. But when I first started here, if if there were one or two women talking to each other in the hallway, a, a bloke could not walk past without saying, oh, look, the ladies are taking over the place. Hmm. It, it, you know, and it wasn't said maliciously. It was supposed to be funny. But um, it is unremarkable now that we are half women. Yes, and it does make such a difference, doesn't it? The, um, the critical mass um, issue, and Julia just pointed that out. And of course, power disparities. Uh, again, you know, these two things are, are very interrelated. Um, Janelle, the work that you've been doing with UN Women means that you deal a lot with um, a, a, actually quite a wide array of leaders in different organisations and in the business world. What sort of, um, uh, sort of good leadership characteristics do you notice? Uh, the people who are creating genuinely inclusive environments. Yeah, thanks so much, Catherine. Again, it's a privilege to be here. I'm so glad to be part of this event. So I think fundamentally it's about role modeling the words that you say. So making sure that when you share a revised policy, when you talk about the importance of implementing the Respect at Work um, framework, that you're really celebrating those people who are standing up and speaking out when they say something, that you're also putting into place very specific consequences when people are perpetrators of sexual harassment. And certainly I think about an organization that we're doing some work with. And the reality is that when you take um, that leadership role really, really with all, all seriousness and you do hold people to account, it makes a huge difference. So, for example, recently just talking to some colleagues at Westpac, they've really put in place completely new management frameworks that make it clear that their zero tolerance policy means if you perpetrate sexual harassment, you will be dismissed. Now that's a real consequence for a real offense. And that's the sort of accountability that we need to have in place. And that's about making sure that leadership across all levels of the business are talking about it, that people really clear what the definition is, so they have a shared understanding of the behavior that we expect. They're modeling that behavior. And again, they're reinforcing those who are standing up and speaking out against the bad and also celebrating the good behaviours. Um, Yemi, when we had a, a briefing, you mentioned something called trauma-informed leadership. Um, mm. I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that from you. What does that mean and why has that become uh, an important kind of leadership? To be honest, Catherine, I get a bit nervous when we float around buzzwords and for those in, I guess, the psychotherapy, psychological world and even probably more mainstream, trauma informed has been floating around a lot. And so when I say I ask for those listening to really hear the essence, which is to inform yourself on trauma and how people respond to it. But where I go further with our leaders is it, had to, it has to start with self. I think there is nothing more unreasonable to assume that our leaders might be able to respond to something as severe as sexual harassment without any internal understanding. And the work is, it's deep, it's hard, but you know, everyone on here, for them to be a leader means they were ready to be in the arena. To be trauma informed means you want to know what this looks like and how it can differ for people. I think it, it gives you a completely different perspective when when supporting teams and individuals that have gone through sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Tanya, um, talking about um, the, the change in the Labor Party and the, the, the number of women now and, change, and how that changes, there's also quite a lot of good evidence from, uh, sadly, too few organisations where women have reached uh, towards that critical mass as well. And certainly having women in senior leadership, uh, it narrows the gender pay gap. Uh, the number of women who are promoted in, it increases. Um, there's still, though, we've got such a long way to go in the private sector. And I, I was just thinking when Julia was speaking, um, she's, you know, she was saying, of course, federal parliament is well behind. But actually, our corporate sector has in some ways gone backwards. Uh, we don't have the number of women in CEO positions and in those very senior jobs that we had even 18 months ago. Um, that's been dispiriting to see, hasn't it? Mm. Um, 
Do you, do you know when I had the women's portfolio in 2007, when we were last in government at the beginning of that time, we were having discussions then about women's representation on boards and women's yep. representation in senior leadership roles. And a lot of good things started at that time. Um, the um, ASX uh, was looking at, you know, promoting uh, at least transparency when it came to women's positions. Um, the Institute of Company Directors was offering, offering scholarships. And uh, Catherine, I know you've written about this uh, extensively. Mm. While that pressure was there, businesses began to do the right thing. The minute you take the pressure away, all of the old habits re-emerge. And I found that really frustrating because I thought once we saw progress in the business world, companies would go, fantastic, our profits are going up, we're making better decisions, we've got a broader, uh, you know, more diverse group of people making decisions, which means we're responding better to the needs of the broader Australian community. I thought that the results would speak for themselves, but that hasn't happened. As soon as um, some businesses felt like the government wasn't kind of looking over their shoulder and, and promoting transparency and equality um, that they kind of started backsliding so I think there needs to we need to keep the pressure up either from government uh, from the community from shareholders whoever it is that can hold um, businesses to account and consumers obviously feature large in that until the cultural change is so embedded that it's um, you know it's self-sustaining uh, and I, I do think that happens. I, I think that's um, happened in the Labor Party, I think, the first few years. I mean, we started our affirmative action journey in 1994. This is not an overnight proposition. We've increased our, uh, as we've met each target, first of all, 35%, then 40%, now 50%. As we've met the targets, we've increased our ambition. Um, so you need to keep up the pressure by continuing to increase your ambition for equality. Um, but but you do get to a stage where um, I think the organisation sees the benefit of improved diversity uh, and then, you, then you're on, on the cusp of these things becoming self-sustaining. Mm. I think um, also, as you say, it's it's about a whole, um, it's a number of areas, I suppose, coming together that coalesce around change. Um, I was reminded of that when I was interviewed recently about the number of women on ASX 200 boards, which has indeed uh, increased. Uh, so we're close to 33%. A remarkable transformation from the roughly 8% in 2009, which was, you know, it's quite an extraordinary change. But it was about a whole lot of factors. It was media, um, I would say that. Um, but, but media did play a role in that. Um, some very important business, uh, powerful business people who stood up and said this is unacceptable in a country like this. It was such an interesting coalition, coalition, coalescing, I should say, of a whole lot of those factors. But it is, um, it is a bit two steps forward, one step back. Do you know, I wonder, I started off speaking this morning about whether we are actually at a point, a circuit breaking point, where we're actually going to see um, more action particularly around workplace sexual harassment because of what's been happening in this country this year. Is that an impression that you get? And do you think that leaders are actually, and let's face it, it could be from um, risk mitigation reasons. It could be for a whole lot of very, very solid commercial reasons. Are we actually going to see that shift, do you think? So my view is it's as if the moral case and the business case are now coalescing in a really synergistic, powerful way. So we have the incredibly high profile cases that, that we all know from Parliament House. We have cases from, you know, AMP from last year and really all throughout private sector and public sector, we hear about these issues um, continuing to reemerge. And I remind, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but violence against women of which sexual harassment is one manifestation. It's the most pervasive manifestation of um, it, it, it's, it's a huge human rights violation against women all across the world. We're, we're certainly not alone. We're, we're in good company in that regard, if I can use that term, which sounds completely backwards. But fundamentally, because of that convergence of the moral case and the business case, I believe there's now more pressure than there has been ever before. And certainly at UN Women globally, there's also a very important look at 
the intersecting forms of discrimination. And I think this is a really important part of the equation here. When we talk about sexual harassment, we need to ensure that we're applying an intersectional lens to what are the lived experiences of victim survivors. If it's a woman with a disability, if it's an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, or Torres Strait Islander woman, if it's a woman you know, of a whole range of diverse races and ethnicities, what are the ways that those power imbalances are affecting their experience in the workforce? What are the ways that they feel unsafe to disclose? And how do we ensure that we're creating not just policies and procedures, but really wraparound support networks mm. for women in all of their diversity who may be experiencing sexual harassment so that they are listened to, they are believed, that there are real consequences for the perpetrators and that they don't put their incomes at risk. They don't put their reputations at risk. So it's it, it, we, we need to make sure that we're looking at all of the different intersecting forms of discrimination that women who are experiencing sexual harassment may be coming with in, in terms of their, their own experiences. But all in all, I would say that combination of a recognition that this has the possibility to have significant impacts. We've talked about shareholder activism and the importance of investors actually yeah. standing up and saying, no, you actually do need to sack a CEO or sack a board chair and do a complete refresh of leadership. That's the sort of activism that I applaud and it's incredibly important because money talks. There are a whole range of, of influences that make people um, take action but it, it's certainly one, one of the powerful ones. Yes, absolutely. And, and on that AMP case, what I also thought was fascinating and that institutional investor pressure that was applied there was quite uh, an interesting example, but also that the women at AMP, uh, from some of the reporting that I read, um, clearly said, do not keep telling us that this is an inclusive culture when we're seeing what is being played out at our senior executive level. So I think that, that force from women coming together, whether it's as employees or as we were talking on the March for Justice, you know, coming together in public demonstrations, that's incredibly important too. Yemi, I wanted to ask you about the entrepreneurial space uh, and women in that area, because women are doing some fantastic things, um, including some quite young women who are going out and setting up their own businesses and doing fabulous stuff. Are we seeing a shift? Do they think differently about what a leader is and what sort of influence and impact that they can have? I mean, absolutely. Like you said, I mean, different generations, we can come call it seasoned and some less seasoned. But I think what's happening is we've got a younger generation who no longer subscribe to a society that doesn't have them hold power or influence when it comes to decision making. Yeah. And for that reason, there is a big shift in, in women going into entrepreneurship. However, it still relies on the fact that there's a lot of funding being sought outside. And if I was to give you statistics on um, percentages of investment for women, it's frighteningly low and even lower when you start to add, um, you know, different variations when you look through an intersectional lens. So there is the hunger for change through entrepreneurship and to actually focus on matters of the heart. And I loved what Janelle mentioned, which is the moral slash business case. Yeah. Let's be real, the world's focus is still working on the GDP. We understand that, but at some point there's going to be a crisis. And I think um, entrepreneurs, especially female entrepreneurs, are probably going to be part of the ones that trigger that crisis for where's the moral line versus the GDP business case line. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. The, um the other thing about entrepreneurs and some of the statistics are really quite troubling. Access to capital for women uh, business owners is a really big barrier and there are some substantial problems there. But it does strike me um, that the women are sort of picking that up and thinking I'm going to, I'm going to kind of chart my course. Uh, something that I can't do as easily when I'm part of a large organisation, for example. Uh, right. So that's, that's something that I... I it, it would be great if we saw more coming out of that. Um, we, ha we are getting some questions, so I'm just going to see... Um, OK, I'll read out just a couple of these. Um, very happy for anyone on the panel to, to have a crack at them. Uh, to what extent is gender representation taking an intersectional approach in Australia? Um, how are we ensuring gender diversity, gender diversity that is able to reflect multicultural Australia? So I guess some of the, we've already touched on some of this, but it's, um, it is actually, intersectionality is an incredibly important um, element. So I don't know if anyone uh, wants to dive in on that. 
Well, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab and please um, and invite everybody else to chime in as well. Um, we have one of the most rigorous reporting frameworks in the world with yeah. the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. It's sensational. It's really exciting that public sector will be, you know, reporting with WGIA through WGIA as well um, as part of the respective work recommendations that have come through. But it is somewhat monolithic in the data that it collects. And that's a shortcoming. That's definitely an area for growth for us as a nation. And there, I would say overall, we have a lot of room to grow and room to improve because for so long, I think there's been almost a siloed approach as we think about increasing diverse representation, whether it's in leadership roles, key management personnel and boards of directors, that people are almost put into boxes, that mm. somebody ticks a woman box and somebody might ticks a person with disability box or an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and or Torres Strait Islander box. We really do need to make sure that when we're talking about women, we're talking about diverse women. Women are not a monolith. Mm. Um, there is no single definition that represents really the homogeneity, but we want to ensure that we have more women represented, more diverse women represented yeah. in leadership at all, in all facets of social, economic and political life here. But we have a lot of work to do in terms of those definitions, how we're reporting and how we're really recruiting and attracting diverse women and creating safe, inclusive, respective workplaces, whether that be parliaments, whether that be sporting organizations, whether that be ASX listed companies. Good point. Um, it is interesting to look at the statistics um, and quite sobering to see how few people in the corporate world who are in senior roles and on boards are from non-Anglo-Saxon backgrounds. Um, and you've actually got to dig through the stats because sometimes they say, oh, they were born overseas, but they're <laughs> of white Anglo-Saxon extraction nonetheless. So um, the statistics are really, are really poor. So a lot more work to be done there. Um, look, we are sort of getting towards the end of our discussion. And I, I just wondered if each of you has a reflection on um, something Julia said and Jenny said earlier, that everyone can be a leader. Um, it's a little bit glib. I know it gets trotted out, but what are the things that people can do in their organisations. They may not be um, part of the top um, pinnacle of the hierarchy, but they do want to see change and they do want to be uh, part of that change. We're all aware, and it will come up, I know, all day, that women do wear the repercussions sometimes of speaking up, and we've, we've already mentioned that. Um, how can women, I always, one of the things I always say to women is do things jointly, do things together. Um, and try and force change as a cohort. Um, is that something that uh, resonates with any of you? Or indeed, have you got other thoughts on how you can actually push this momentum along in, in your own organisation? Um, maybe Tanya can start with you. Mm. I think, um, well, one of the things that I've observed over the last few months, because we've been having more conversations about sexual harassment and safety at work, is uh, most of the women I speak to who have raised a specific complaint or issue actually say, I didn't do it for myself. I wanted my workplace to be safer for others. And I, I have really mixed feelings about this because um, I see that, that desire to be of service to others and mm. the organisation and to put your own needs last um, yet again, as a as a kind of, um, I love it and I admire it, and it troubles me at the same time because every single one of us has the right to be safe at work. Um, but it, I think uh, what you're saying about working together with others in the organisation to make the workplace a safe and welcoming and supportive workplace for everyone, if we if we need to think about it as not being selfish, but about being um, you know, good for the people that I work with, mm. uh, you know, whatever gets you there, I suppose, uh, is the answer. Um, I think um, it's also really important. So we need to have really clear rules, procedures, protocols, training that informs us of that, consequences con that are consistent. So getting the, the organisation to move formally on all of these things is important. But the truth is that a whole lot of this discussion takes place informally and below the surface of organisations. Mm. So if you are that person in the organisation 
that people come to for help and support and advice, you need to make sure that you receive the training that you need, that you look after you, yourself. It is actually very hard to have a lot of disclosures made to you of um, sexual assault in particular or sexual harassment. Um, make sure that you're, you've got the, the support and the outlet to talk about that um, and a way to, to deal with it in a, in, that, that isn't re-traumatising yourself, if, if, particularly if you've been a victim of sexual assault or sexual harassment and then people are disclosing all the time to you, you need to do a bit of self-care around that. Yeah. Um, and finally, and this is a really difficult one, um, my, my hope is that if people have a complaint in the workplace, that they will feel empowered to take that complaint forward because Unless people do that, you don't see deep and systemic change. But we also really have to be led by the victim uh, or, uh, or the survivor of the uh, assault or harassment. And quite often people may not want to pursue, formally pursue a complaint. They just want someone to listen to them. Yeah. And getting the balance right um, in those two things when our, our desire is for permanent and systemic and formal formalised change, um, that, that's a really tough one. And you have to have thought that through very carefully uh, before you um, disrespect the wishes of someone who's disclosing to you. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not a simple um, balancing act either, is it? Um, no. We have had actually quite a few more questions come through. Um, maybe time for just uh, one or two thoughts. Um, somebody's brought up the VEX question of merit um, that we still seem to use as a default to appoint a lot of men into positions and how we I, challenge. I, I can answer this one. <laughs> Honestly, if merit were the deciding factor, half the positions would already be held by women. <laughs> I love it. Um, somebody once gave me the definition of merit in this context, and it was a man. He said it's mates elevated regardless of intellect or talent. Uh, so I always trot that one out as well. And I think it's become an excuse. It's not a reason, it's an excuse for not moving on. Um, then um, just what role do you see community organisations such as sports organisations play in creating change? Which is a really topical question and I know we could talk about it for a long time. But just maybe Yemi and, and Janelle some thoughts on that. So there were, we've, we've talked a bit about business organisations, parliament. What about um, community and, uh, and other kinds of uh, organisations and what role they play? I'll just very quickly say, I mean, you go to the old adage of it takes a village. Community needs to have more of a voice. Completely appreciate that we put votes into our politicians and have utmost respect for every single one of them and really wouldn't want to be in their positions. But part of the support is community. And, and yes, you do have organisations like whether it's sports or the arts industry. I, I, think we, I think we need to start changing our model. And for that requires a really bold paradigm shift of which community should be at the centre. Yeah, and there's so many fantastic networks of women too, yeah. um, which are across industries, businesses, but also right through the community. Women do have some real strength in those organisations. Um, and Janelle, UN Women obviously is a fantastic organisation, not a community one, but, but that's a model that we can all sort of learn from, I guess. Yeah, thanks Catherine. I mean, certainly in the region, UN Women is looking at who are the influencers? Sometimes that's sports leaders, sometimes that's faith-based leaders. We have to think about where people are gathering and making sure that, as Yemi rightly says, they've got a seat at the table, that they're influencing decisions that are really affecting members of our community, shaping attitudes which shape behavior. And that's, uh, you know, we look at the end of sexual harassment being a continuum of change, which starts it, at home, it's it's through schools, it's through faith communities, sporting organisations, all of the different ways and places and spaces that we consume information that shapes who we are, who we believe um, we can be in the world and what is okay and what is not okay. It's, it's such a good word, influence. I remember many years ago we were setting up the, what became the Women of Influence Awards at the Financial Review and we toyed with the name of that for a long time and decided quite deliberately not to use the word leader or leadership. We decided that was actually sometimes quite off-putting to women, whereas influence was an accessible 
um, and very powerful word as well. Um, I'm afraid we are going to have to wind up our discussion. It's been fantastic to have all three of you here. Thank you so much for your time and your insights um, and for all the work that all three of you do in your different spheres. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks.